Hi, and welcome to Guitar Economics. The video that you're going to watch now is a really, really important video. It's the presentation that hand surgeon Mark Phillips and I did in Oslo in September uh, 22. We were at the Musician and Performing Arts Health and Performance Conference, which is uh, sort of the international conference in performing arts medicine. And we were invited there to talk about our joint work that we have done now for more than three years. I hope you would enjoy this presentation. It starts with Mark Phillips talking about his work as a hand surgeon. And then I go through some of the work that I have done for the last 20 years. And I hope it will give you a lot of knowledge and information about the work that we do together, but also about the work that I do. And as always, you are more than welcome to contact me if you have any questions or if you want to see me for a session. So please enjoy this video from the conference in Oslo, Norway, this year in September. Thank you very much. Mm. So this is what we spoke about at the uh, MHPC 22 conference in Oslo uh, last month. Um, mm. And so other people can watch the video uh, uh, and listen to the talk. So um, essentially, uh, we introduced ourselves, didn't we? And, um, uh, and so basically I can introduce myself now and you can introduce yourself now. So, so I'm a hand surgeon, London, uh, 25 years working uh, mostly in the NHS and now the last six years have been private uh, only. I'm a keen amateur trumpet player and I inherited this huge uh, musician's hand practice off Ian Winspur and John White a few years ago and I've really enjoyed doing it. And you? Yeah, so I am Paul Anastogo. I'm a guitarist as you do, based in Guildford, the UK and I'm a performing arts coach and executive functioning coach and I have been working with guitarists for 20 years, uh, helping them rehabilitating their technique. And I also have a background in psychology, which also plays a large part of my work with guitarists. Cool. Right. So this is what we went on to talk about. So um, uh, so how did we get to this point where we had a partnership uh, working together? And actually, interestingly, Paul, what we discovered when we were there, that we were the only people in Europe that really did anything like this. When I did a similar thing with Penelope Roskell about the piano in the American Performance Arts Association, it seemed the case there. So people aren't doing this collaboration between hand surgeons and technique pedagogues around the world. It's uh, it's an extraordinary thing. Um, and so, um, so one of the reasons that we went and did this was because we wanted to find out whether anybody else was doing this and we could talk to them about their experience. But um, we were thrown together, weren't we, Paul, when we... Um, uh, largely at the beginning of lockdown we, i've been sending you patients before that as face-to-face -face people and then in lockdown we got to know each other a lot better because it was easier for you being in guildford and me being in london mm -hmm. to speak to each other on zoom and discuss cases and we had some time on our hands so that we could discuss our cases and uh and from there it grew yeah it's been a remarkable experience really uh to do that and we've done this now for what is it three years now i think yeah, so yeah it's been really good. so um uh so uh so back BAPAM was the point at which we got to know each other because we both do clinics for BAPAM and you've done them for a, a lot longer than I have mm -hmm. um, uh, as their go-to technique pedagogue for guitar and and I started doing clinics for BAPAM about five years ago but when it came to lockdown uh, they put us both together in a, in a great way and uh, we've been able to um, uh, continue to collaborate since then. BAPAM by the way shout out to them marvellous organisation this is their website um, and they are a great signposting uh, organization for help for musicians and performance arts people. Uh, so this this is this was a, a model that I uh, came up with after working in a sports clinic for uh, a few years. I, I realized that that basically the hand for a musician is an elite athlete uh, organ, um, and it needs to be regarded like a, a sportsman's body, really, um, and. In the sports clinic that I work in, uh, this is what you can expect. If you're an elite tennis player, for example, then you'd expect a, a, a tennis doctor to be on hand for you. You'd expect a, a tennis physiotherapist that knows about the common injuries that happen in tennis. And your coach would be somebody who would um, uh, know about the injuries that happen in tennis. Um, that's a given. Uh, and all of them have an overlap of knowledge uh, that goes on uh, in the central part here. And there's some knowledge that the physician and the coach will share and some knowledge that the the coach and the physiotherapist will share and the doctor and the physiotherapist will share and uh and then there's a small nugget of information in the middle of this uh yeah, this venn diagram and around all of that you've got psychology as well and, and sports people expect that too and so some patients 
just need me. So if they come to see me and uh, they've got a broken wrist and they need me to fix it, uh, I might just do that. Or if, uh, But usually I'll need a hand therapist to help me with their rehabilitation afterwards. And they don't need to uh, see a technique specialist at all in those cases. They get back to doing the technique just as they did before. Uh, but some patients will come to see me and it's clear that they don't need an operation and they don't need a steroid injection. And they and so that's something that often I do and that they don't get to hand therapy or this. If they've got a trigger finger, for example, they'll just see me and go away and they'll be happy and they won't need anybody else's help. Um, but there'll be some cases where it's clear to me that maybe some technique modification would be helpful. They might need a bit of hand therapy as well. And some patients that I see uh, will quite, it'll become quick, uh, quickly obvious that what they really need is some psychological mm -hmm. help. Uh, and we can provide that too. And BAPAM have amazing uh, people to help in that regard too. So, but most often patients need a bit more of all of these things really. Um, and we use them uh, as needed. So, so how does this system work? So basically I, I see patients in my clinic um, and because Paul isn't a clinician and doesn't see primary patients, essentially he doesn't have students directly come to him and then therefore, so he doesn't refer to me, I tend to refer to Paul. Uh, and, and if I, of the group of patients that I see that are guitarists and within that, the subgroup of people who are uh, in need of some technique pedagogy, I refer them on to Paul and pass on some information uh, to him about the nature of the problem, we discuss it, uh, and then Paul will see them. And in lockdown, we had the luxury of being able to see people together. I learned a bit about pedagogy and what, how he works. Um, uh, and then they may need um, some um, simple advice from him, uh, uh, or they may, uh, and some patients don't need uh, Paul's advice at all. So the conditions I see most commonly are mostly tendonitis in the form of trigger finger, tendonitis in the form of carpal tunnel or other forms of tendonitis. And then after tendonitis, 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 I see patients with other conditions. Guitar is the second commonest instrument that I see. Uh, and this is a count of uh, the patients I see in my clinic, mostly pianists and uh, guitars closely followed by violinists. I don't actually know how many, uh, what the what the denominator of this is, but this is the numerator of that uh, equation. So basically, I don't know how many people in the country play piano, how many people play guitar, and how many people play violin, for example, and I'd like to find that out, and I'm setting out to, to try and discover that, to see which is the most disproportionately represented uh, instrument in my clinic. It wouldn't surprise me if it was the guitar, which, as Paul will discuss uh, later on, it's a brutal instrument. Mm. So, uh, and these are the conditions I see. Uh, carpal tunnel. I wanted to have a little look at to see whether um, uh, there were conditions that were associated with certain instruments. Carpal tunnel seems to be a little bit more common in pianists and guitarists than it is in violinists and cellists. Um, and then arthritis, pretty evenly spread at around seven or eight percent across all instruments and people who aren't instrument, in, instrument players at all. So um, that's not uh, something that uh, selects by instrument or being a musician. And, and similarly, uh, the, the mention of tendonitis or tendon problems in, in, your, in my clinic is, is not strongly um, uh, correlated with being a musician or any particular instrument. I do lots of things for people, treat them with steroids, hand therapy, surgery, general anesthetic and local anesthetic procedures, excise things. Um, and uh, if uh, they do need to go on to Paul, um, then I'll continue to keep them under follow-up. And Paul will let me know uh, how they've been getting on. So I'll hand over to you, Paul, um, and you can do the rest of the talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Yes. And so this part of the talk is about uh, the kind of problems that I see uh, for the last 20 years and some of the uh, things that you can do as a guitarist to overcome these problems. So what are some of the common problems? Well, some of the problems we see with the guitarist is that they are self-taught. And if they're just copying from other guitarists, they may not think critically about what they're seeing because all the guitarists are, of course, individuals and therefore are different. And you cannot just copy somebody else's technique without maybe getting some problems. It's OK to, to do things already learning from YouTube and Facebook. I mean, I've got a YouTube channel as well. But there is a problem if you're just copying again and learning something without thinking about the psychology behind uh, actually playing the instrument and also the physical aspect. So how do you hold and balance the instrument? Even uh, people who come from, from many of the uh, conservatories, some of those 
do not really offer courses in ergonomics or anatomy, which means that you as a guitarist maybe not really understand the functioning, for example, of, of your hand. Uh, again, uh, the Alexander technique can be extremely useful, but only if you take your instrument to the lessons. The other problem is maybe that uh, you may have a really good guitar uh, teacher, but as you know, if you've been on my uh, YouTube channel, it actually helps that uh, the teacher understands the ergonomics of the guitar, because as a student, you may just copy your teacher. And if your teacher is doing something that isn't quite correct, this could become a problem for you. Another thing that we see quite often is this thing that as a guitarist, we can become really obsessed with practicing. And that's not good because if you're just practicing endless for with um, many, many hours without actually having a break, that can lead to injury. The other thing is uh, a thing that we have seen uh, both you and I, Mark, is that some guitarists will take a long time to seek help even up to 10 years. And that means that the rehabilitation can be very difficult and actually take years because it involves relearning. And then finally, and this is a video also that, that you and I have made before, is the no pain, no gain culture. This is absolutely incorrect. You should not have any pain when you're playing the guitar. So please don't become an end gainer where all you're thinking about is result, but actually think about the journey. Well, how do I get there? Because that is actually more important than the results uh, on its own. So what are some of the most common mistakes that I've seen? Well, the first one and the most important one is that the guitarist adopt the body to the instrument and not the instrument to the body. And you really need to learn that if you want to have a good guitar technique. Your body should be in a natural state and your instrument should be adapted to the body, not the other way around. We've got something from the Alexander technique we call the primary control, which is the relationship between the head, neck and the back. And this is really important when you're playing, that you understand how that works when you are playing and also when you are teaching, so that there is that freedom of movement between the head, the neck and the back. A big problem is driving the head forwards because the guitar is, of course, a visual instrument. It's absolutely fine to look at your, uh, your hands when you're playing, but if you drop the head forward, you're creating a lot of tension, which is not a good idea. So just drop your eyes instead. A lack of warm-up and cool down, that's really important. Anyone knows that when, when they're playing an instrument or doing a sport, so make sure that you do that and you can find loads of exercises for that. The practice sessions are too long. Not a great idea because you're not really paying attention when you're practicing endlessly to your body feedback. So you can get really uh, tired and get lots of pain. So mental awareness is decreased in, in those kind of situations and we should avoid that. Before you start practicing, make sure you have a goal. So you know exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to achieve it. How do you measure progress? Well, if you don't know how to measure progress, then how do you know that your practice session actually was useful? And I'll come back to that in a sec. One of the problems on the guitar is that we have a lot of repetitive movements. And the danger of that is when you're practicing it, that you just do the same bars or scales over and over again, causing a pain and fatigue. If your guitar is too big, you will have a problem because you'll be overreaching uh, with your arms and hands and that can create a lot of problems. So make sure that your guitar is the right size for your body. Another thing is of course, that after you've been practicing, you might get onto your laptop and do other work. Well, that means again, you're just sitting down. You need to get away from the instrument and walk around and, and maybe do some stretches. And finally, poor breathing technique. And I just advise you to, uh, to look at my video on, on breathing technique on my YouTube channel. On the classical guitar, there are a number of things here uh, that you need to look at. And I'm not going to go through all of this because you can, you can just pause the video and look through these. But the overall idea is that actually you don't need your upper body. So let's say you're sitting down playing classical guitar. You don't really need your upper body to balance the guitar. You can actually balance the guitar between your legs. And I've got videos on my YouTube channel you can watch to, uh, to see how that is done. Uh, and there are a couple of things in terms of, of the left hand, you know, that you need to, to really use your greater muscles from your shoulders and your back when you're using your left hand. So the hand that is fretting on, on the guitar. And for the right hand, uh, if you come in on the guitar in the right position, then actually your right hand can be totally free from the shoulder and all the way down to the hand. It doesn't need to rest on the guitar body because that can be actually called fixation and tension. So there are a couple of things there. And finally, I just don't use the rest stroke. Um, I actually um, use the free stroke a lot because that, that's much better. So let's move on to the next slide. Electric guitar, very similar to classic guitar, but uh, some of the things is that please don't uh, be sitting practicing on your bed, whatever guitar you're playing. Um, your strap needs to be quite thick, so can it support you when you're holding the guitar over your shoulder? And the left hand, uh, you know, be careful about what you do with the left hand, the one that if that's the one that frets the, the, the guitar. 
uh, you really need to relax it. And when you're bending strings on electric guitar, you need to relax the hand after that and then stop using, using the thumb. Uh, for the right hand, I often see people putting their little finger on the guitar body, which just means that you are in contraction and stuck on the guitar. It's not a good idea. Or hold the plectrum too tight, which there's no need to do. Uh, and there's some over rotation of the wrist and, and, and the wrist bending in much, which is not a good idea. And you really need to be careful with what picking technique you are using. That's very, very important. So here are some pictures that we can just look at. Uh, this is with the classic guitar. A classic guitar is sitting down and you can see on the correct position of the guitar that the guitar is held between the legs. The upper body is not involved in it at all, which I think is a great idea. The incorrect position, you can see the guitar is leaning forward, uh, turning the body, sort of twisting the body like that over the guitar. Uh, and therefore for prolonged use will cause quite a lot of pain. Look at the left hand here. You can see that this is a much more uh, relaxed position, notice that the wrist is as straight as it can be. And that's much, much better position uh, for the left hand on a classic guitar. And now you can see just the opposite. You can see how uh, you've got issues with bending the wrist here. And, and again, with the thumb coming up over the neck, which is not a good idea. These two types of positions are positions that I would suggest you avoid using. Right hand technique, you can see now the right hand's coming in straight on the guitar. The wrist is as straight as it can be uh, on the on the picture. This is correct and incorrect. You can see how here, how there is a tilt of the hand uh, towards uh, the right away from the guitar. And that can cause a lot of pain in your wrist. So here we've got the electric guitar and you can see here again, I'm using the same type of technique coming in with a very uh, relaxed and straight a wrist straight onto the guitar. And the incorrect one, where I'm actually uh, putting the little finger down on the guitar as a support me mechanism, and you can see there how far away my hand, my right hand actually is from the guitar strings, and that's not a good idea. And so we got here a right hand technique for electric guitar, and you can see it's very relaxed. It's okay that the thumb comes up over the neck. That's absolutely fine, as long as you don't bend it constantly. Uh, again, a very nice uh, uh, wrist there. And the incorrect one, not notice that bend there. That's really unhelpful. You can compare the two to each other and see the difference. So what can you do? Well, you need to learn to breathe. I talked about watching that video before. You can do that. Think about a holistic approach to your, to your playing and be really aware of what you are doing with your body when you are playing. Very short practice sessions, absolutely. Five minutes, take a break, think about what you've done, get away from the guitar and come back. Visualization is fantastic. I have a whole video on how you visualize to learn your music without using the instrument. And I really encourage you to check that out. Shadow practicing, you can play on the instrument, but actually without putting pressure on the fretboard. So you are practicing your music, but you're using very little muscular activity. Delayed continuity, again, check this video out, but it's basically a way of, learning to play by measuring your progress. And I'm not going to go into the details about delay continuity in this video, but check it out on my YouTube channel. It's a phenomenal way of learning to play anything really fast, uh, but in a very short amount of time. So as we talked about before, drop the eyes, but don't drop your head when you're looking at the fretboard uh, to avoid tension in the neck. And only use the muscle group that you really need for playing. So think about how much pressure do I actually need to put on the guitar when I'm playing with my, uh, my hand and my fingers and, and my arm and shoulder and so on. The peripheral view is one of the greatest things because you can actually look straight out, uh, say, at the audience, but you can actually see what you're doing with your left hand from your peripheral view. And what it does, it um, takes tension away. So there's uh, less tension in your, your head, your neck, and your back. So here are some ideas of strategies that you can apply uh, to get a better technique. Marvellous, uh, really good stuff there, Paul. Uh, thank you for that. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure working with you. So these are the resources then that we've got on our respective websites. Um, there's loads of content online under the blog section. I'll be putting this up there as well. And you've got your own website, two websites actually. Um, yeah, and YouTube channel, yeah. Yeah, with the YouTube channel, yeah. And then you've got, um, APAM and the Royal Society of Musicians and Health Musicians, a really useful organization too for resources. Um, so um, BAPAM, great place to be signposted to further help. Um, and uh, if you need to be seen, uh, I, you can contact BAPAM and they will offer you an appointment if you're a musician. Yeah, and I think the, the best advice I think we can give to, to guitarists who are watching this is come early rather than late if you need help because there's a much higher, I think, chance for success 
and much less relearning to do if you come early with your problem instead of waiting. Absolutely. Right, well, um, uh, we'll finish it here then, Paul, and um, we'll do more in the future. Absolutely. Great to see you, Mark. Good to see you.